like we have uh, critical mass of people here. Um, and uh, I just want to first welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out to our uh, last general meeting of the year. Uh, it's been a great year, and we've gotten a lot of things done at Rosedale Park. I'm going to update you on some things that are going on. Just as a few housekeeping matters, um, tonight is our election night. We're going to be electing new officers and board, uh, board members tonight, so if you didn't already get a ballot, uh, you should be able to get a ballot uh, at the desk with Frank. Um, please fill it in and put it in the box at the table in the back. Um, they'll be counted during the meeting. I think we want the ballots turned in by 7.45 um, so we can have them counted before the end of the meeting. And if you already voted online like I did, I voted at Rosedale Park at that board. We don't need to vote again in person. You're all set. Uh, but if you did not vote by vote online, um, please make sure you have a ballot and turn your ballot in tonight. Um, we are selling hoodies out right outside the door. Um, if you are a uh, Roseville Park t-shirt that you already brought is not enough to keep you warm in the Michigan winter, you might want to get a Roseville Park sweatshirt. So they're outside, they're $25. Um, get one and express your neighborhood, your neighborhood pride. They're really good for those walks that we take in the fall and the winter outside. Um, Thank you. So that's it for, for housekeeping. We have with us tonight a um, really special surprise visitor. Our Congresswoman Rashida Khalid is here with us tonight. Yeah. Um, I want to ask the Congresswoman to come up and give us just a congressional update. Um, some things that are going on in Congress that we need to know about, maybe things we need to be monitoring, and just anything else you want our neighbors in Northwest Detroit to know about. Thank you so much for being here. Act and, and here we'll be able to finally have some form 
of paid uh, family medical leave programs so folks don't have to choose between caring, caring for their loved ones and putting food on their table. The, the other really big one is extending the child tax credit. Why be popular? You know, I think many of you might have remembered when earning income tax credit came about. Very bipartisan supported. It was one of the most profound and life-changing, anti successful anti-poverty uh, programs. But it's not working anymore as well. So this is, I call this the child tax credit, like, you know, it's really your EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit on Steroids. And it's much broader. So it includes those that might not admit the, the income or requirements um, in regards to working as a frontline worker. So this is uh, at least 35 million families will be able to get the child tax credit extension. And also, this is my favorite, if you know Wayne County, if you haven't felt it, you should know, Wayne County hasn't met Clean Air Act standards in over 15 years. This means high rates of asthma, respiratory issues, a number of things that you hear about. So there's an investment of $555 billion over the next 10 years in clean real, real clean energy and climate investment to fight climate change. Um, the other really great one, you should check this one out, this is the job creator that I know our community will get, is investing nearly $20 billion in Civilian Climate Corps. It's a big, big, big movement. Again, if you guys remember Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, all these crisis programs, this is a similar thing, but this is about combating climate, uh, the climate crisis, so I'm excited about that. And it's going to really put thousands of our young people to, to work to address climate, and I also think it's very healing when you're able to, to really be with um, understanding the importance of land, air, uh, water, all of those things. Uh, the other really important thing is, so everyone knows, we need $1.65 billion to remove all the service lines in Michigan, lead service lines in Michigan, $1.65 billion. That's nothing compared to what's right. So there's an additional $9 billion. The infrastructure bill didn't go far enough. It left us short. So, uh, you know, one thing I told Governor Whitmer is, you know, I'm committed and I'm starting to get out the lead caucus and really working with my colleagues because this is a national crisis. I've got to tell you, what I've been hearing, and maybe it's just because I'm a mom of two boys, is when our children are exposed to lead, it really impacts their brain development and how they learn. You know, Charlie Chisholm used to say, the first African-American member of Congress used to say, a child can't learn if they're hungry, but she used to fight for the free lunch program and everybody dismissed her. Can you imagine our country without the free lunch program now? You can. And so our children cannot thrive, they cannot learn if they're being poisoned with lead. So we have to really fight hard and the additional money we need to truly remove service lines is in Build Back Better. That wakes the, what passed, uh, what folks think is, is the full plan passed by certain. Again, they separated it by disagreeing. So um, the other really important thing is there is a pathway to protect our immigrant neighbors in there. It doesn't a pathway to citizenship, but it gets us close to at least having some sort of understanding that we have a broken system here. And so we really got to work hard in understanding that these are our, many of them have been our neighbors for over 10, 20 years now. Um, Last thing is, is, and a couple more things is really quick, is the providing $1 billion for Older Americans Act programs. This is around long-term care. Um, but this is really, really important. We don't have good long-term care in our country for our, our, our senior, seasoned residents that really need it. So this is, again, $1 billion. It, should, it was more. I swear it was more. And they kept cutting it, but that's okay. They seem to be able to find $400 billion for a millionaire's tax, no joke. But I can't get $1.65 million to, to remove lead. Um, but I'm not going to do that for a second. Go on that tangent. Um, she, said, she said, don't go on the, she's like, don't go on that tangent. But I, I just, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But I, I want you to know the biggest investment that we're ever going to see on housing, this is so important, is, is uh, $151 billion. Now, what, like Chairwoman Maxine Waters, she, you know, we had it at $350 billion. And we're still going to support it. So people are like, oh, you know, you want perfect. I said, no, I want pathways. Don't cut the pathways for us to, because when we get this in and ain't working, we can fix it. So $151 billion towards affordable housing. Do you guys know $65 billion will go towards repair for our nation's public housing, preserving and improving about 500,000 public units across the country? Um, also in there is $9 billion investment in our historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and then lastly, of course, $39 billion in real sustainable resilience and equitable transportation infrastructure that reduces our carbon pollution and promote clean transit. Again, it is so important to understand Build Back Better agenda was a whole big, pro a whole big um, uh, package 
And this part is critically important for us to follow through on the promises we made in regards to health care, real climate resiliency to deal with flooding around our country, really removing lead out of our water, housing, and so much more. Um, so know that I will be there uh, cheering my colleagues on by, for doing the right thing and moving forward with Build Back Better. Again, it is widely popular. Please, I know you all watch and you're very astute and you're nice. Don't let them label it as left. Left. No. Paid leave is widely popular. 80% of Americans are concerned about water. They want paid leave, child care, widely, prescription drugs, widely popular to negotiate prescription drugs. So don't let them label. This is an American issue. And I'll tell you, you can find Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents across our country that will support Build Back Better. And by the way, it is completely paid for. The infrastructure bill wasn't, but this bill is completely paid for. <laughs> completely paid for. Completely paid for because we tax the rich. So I really do want you all to please um, continue to talk about the Build Back Better agenda and why we need that in our communities. And it is, again, life-changing. It'll be a 10-year-long investment in something that we haven't seen since the 1930s. Um, with that, again, I appreciate it. Uh, we are still really quickly, fe fe this Friday is the deadline for FEMA. A lot of folks are still waiting last night. Y'all wait last night. Uh, if you know anybody that is, please tell them. This is, we already got about $40 million back into the district from the FEMA, and we pushed and pushed our residents, and they called, and they were complaining to me about stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to work on the big structural issues, but I need you to apply so I can get you, you know, the money you need to clean out your basements and all those kinds of things. And we did help a number of folks that were not happy with what they got from FEMA. We are helping them make an appeal process. And we, we actually have been very successful in that. It does sometimes require an inspector to come to the house. Not a big deal. They don't vote, but they, they're not looking at anything else but where the damage was. So just know from folks that got their roofing repaired, a number of other things because of the flooding in June, um, please don't let those dollars go away. We need to make sure that our neighbors, many of you might already apply and may not have been impacted, but you know somebody that was. All of us knew somebody that was impacted by the flooding. So please make sure uh, that you connect with our office and we can help you walk through that process. With that, I think we're done. And everyone knows Larissa. She's a resident here, but uh, she's my deputy uh, chief. And honestly, uh, she and I, in partnership, we really work this stuff out. And we use the power of the letterhead, the power of our call. I love that I can call DTE and they call me back. You know how amazing that is? It's kind of like, no, as a social worker at heart, you know, and an organizer before, I mean, in state rep, they didn't call me as fast as they do now as I'm a congressman. So use our office. I'm being serious. I had a councilman today, I had a little funeral, and he's like, oh, Shia, DT called me right back. I'm like, mm -hmm. use my office. Use the power of the letterhead. Use the power to convene. Uh, we're here to help you in any way we can. All right, thank you. I love when our elected representatives show up at our meetings and come and give us information. And I mean, as long as, as much as we deal with local um, issues here um, in Rosedale and at these meetings, we do need to know what's going on on a national level. And it's nice to hear it right from the horse's mouth. Um, so thank you so much, Congresswoman, for coming and being with us tonight. Okay, um, I'm going to jump around on the agenda a little bit, um, and is, is Inspector VC here, by the way? He is here, okay, we can actually um, bring you up next to you. Okay, um, we have with us tonight Inspector William VC from VC. He's going to tell you what that stands for, and hopefully tell you a little bit about his department and what his, what his role is, and then, uh, if possible, take some questions. Thank you so much for being here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Inspector Beasy. I am the District Inspector for District 1. I, I started off as the District Inspector for 7, then 2, and 1, but since Inspector Schumann has retired, he has passed the baton on to me, so it's my pleasure. And basically, BC is Building Safety, Engineering, and Environment. And our main focus is dealing with blight throughout the entire city. The neighborhoods are very important. It's not just downtown. The neighborhoods are very important. We've just started an initiative about a month ago where we called it from blight to beauty. So we've identified 12 major corridors throughout the city. The ones that are in one would be Grand River, McNichols, Seven Mile, and Eight Mile. And we're going down from one end to the other, and 
and we're looking for blighted, vacant buildings, even open buildings, or a lot of businesses maybe doing auto repair, and they just take over the side streets. And come the spring, we're working, GSD has hired a bunch of people. So now, not only do we write the correction orders and we ticket them, now, once we ticket them, GSD comes out, remove the blight, attach a bill to the ticket, and then we, we see the results that we're, we're having a lot of success. You may have seen the yellow stickers if you ride down uh, McNichols or Seven Miles, this place down the door. So we're out. They just hired the department, 15 new inspectors. We've got another 10 coming on next week. So. We're just committed to doing what we can to help remove the blight in the city. I also want to, if you don't know, if you've got a smartphone, we have an app called Improve Detroit. I need a phone, okay, so that you're making my job very easy. Um, I, I was in a meeting today with the uh, district manager. We meet once every two weeks. So if you have any complaints or whatever, you can send it to the district manager there, put it on a smart sheet. Or just let someone here know and they know they don't want us to give out our number anymore. Certain people have our number. So, yeah, I, I, I tell them I work for you guys. You know, y'all pay my phone bill. Why wouldn't I ask you? So, 313 498 1958. Once again, that's 313 498 1958. You didn't get it from Inspector Lee. Questions? I'm not going to be long. Any any particular questions? Yes, ma'am. So are you also doing residential like? Any any and everything. Anything in District One that requires a building inspector. We're also working with GSD and the environmental inspector. So what they call us now is we're quarterback. So you call us and we can get it to go where it needs to go. So can you give us some examples of residential? Uh, overgrown grass. One thing we do not do is poor build containers. That would be an environmental. But if I got a call, then I would reach out to the environmental uh, inspector. But anything to do with the envelope of the building, the premise, the vacant lot. Um, Collapsing garages. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I, I take care of all of that. It's just a process of correction order, and then we have to take it. Now, the only thing is, before we started this program with GSD, all I could do was a correction order and tickets. Now we can get GSD to go and actually remove the blight, remove the problem, tow the vehicles, and get it done. So you will see a difference coming. Yeah, GSD is. I think they're about to hire 50 new people. Uh, yeah, it's a big push. It's part of the rescue uh, funds. So you're going to see a big difference in the neighborhood. The mayor is really committed to the neighborhood. So you're, by the spring, you'll really see. Yes, ma'am. I have a question specific address that you give you. Should I wait till after? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just text it to me. Just text me the address. I just gave you the number. Okay. So. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Well, I'm, you're my contact. There you go. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Yes? I had a couple houses on our drive um, in Brightwater. Mm -hmm. And I sent it on to you guys, and nothing happened. But I think it's pretty bad. Out there. Yeah. 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 That's part of the district one. Yeah. So I mean, should we yeah, just, I, I was on the one on our drive today, 9980. Uh -huh. So just give them to us, and we'll get on them. But it's a process. Yeah. So it's, once again, as far as you see the visual difference, that's going to come when GSD can go and do it. But we're right, and unfortunately, a lot of them are land based properties. Yeah. And GSD is going to go and clean those properties up as well. But up until now, when COVID hit, GSD was focusing on the alleys because they couldn't get the internet for the children. So all of the resources were going there so they could work remotely from home. So we're getting it together. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm a social worker and I've got clients that live in that rent unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. Would your would you be yes. an organization I could call yes. to, to help them? Yes. Okay. We'll come out, we'll do an inspection, we deal with no heat, we do deal with sewer in the basement, yeah, elevated blood levels, any anything at all to deal with safety. That we be your first call that if it's not in our department, I will refer it to the property department. Yes. I'm sorry, what does CSP stand for? Building Safety Engineering and Environment. GSD. Oh, General Service Division. If it's an emergency within three days, if it's just overgrown grass within a week, that's the time frame that we have. But normally a day or two, where we're actually out, where we have eyes on the issue, and then you know they take a day or two to put it in the system. We have to do deed checks or clear. And some some property owners in Detroit are very creative, <laughs> and uh, they they know how to do this and, you know, and we're working on, on, on a case right now where one little small office is the head for like 200, the address for 200 companies. And they all have addresses and they're some lawyers. So we're going after them, yeah. We're, we're, we're getting it, we've got the resources now and the manpower, so we're able to focus. Cause you, you just can't just do people any kind of way. He has sold all of his properties, and he did seven days in jail. Yeah. Well, he's laying contracted to rest. Yes. Yes. Well, he, we're done with him, and he did seven days. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so my question, I guess my question is, is, is your inspections also dealing with, with the transfer of properties under the land contracts? Because that's one of that's been one of the issues in, in the community where these some lords they pass them over on land contract they get no occupancy permit they get no inspection and and, and and we're stuck we have a property I have a property directly behind my home that's been in disrepair for at least 15 years or more um, I mean it, it's needed a roof for the last 18 years and you got holes in the roof. And fisher boards missing, gutters falling down, um, those sort of issues. Um, in the past, um, I used to be able to call the the um, representative from the historic district commission, and I get no answer to that number anymore. Hmm. Well, what we do, a lot of owners are doing that. They're to circumvent the land inspections and all of that, what they're doing is they're doing land contracts and they're not really properly executed. Mm -hmm. But my position and our team position is that the property maintenance code says the last registered deed owner. And that's what we're going with and that's what we're pursuing. And we let the lawyers fight it out. Mm -hmm. But the code is on our side. It's the deed, the last registered deed owner. It says nothing about a land contract, and that's what we're going with into the world. And I, we do DAH, which is, is Department of Administrative Hearings, but I also can write 36 district tickets, uh, okay. and that gets a lot of, a lot of results. Anyway. Yes, ma'am. What about registration for rental properties and registration for rental properties? Okay, if a property is vacant for 30 days, they're supposed to register. They're, they're actually, in a, the end of October, a few days ago, they're changing the rental registration. It's going to be either, it, it's going to stay with the owner, it's good until the owner, or it's going to be four years. They're, they're, they haven't finalized it yet. We just had a meeting yesterday about that. So it's going to be some changes on that and the land inspection that's required, but it's not finalized yet. Okay. Yes, Ms. Keith. Hi. Um, to piggyback off of Dale's um, question, 
and in him, if a, if a property is not properly registered, rental registered, but they are on a land contract, is there anything that BC can do to backdate if it's not properly uh, permitted for uh, occupancy? Yeah, well, we, we get it the same. If it doesn't have a CFC, if it doesn't have a lead, we're going to write those tickets. Okay. The CFC ticket is $250. The lead, no lead, is $750. So basically, it's about $1,250 worth of tickets. And that's just the first round. If they're found responsible, we go to second round, it'll be more money, third round, and then we go 36th district. Um, the, the new head of our department, she's not new, but Ms. Parker, she's the CEO, the Chief Enforcement Officer, and she don't play. She, she, she don't play, so we, we get it done. What's the time frame on that enforcement process? You said first time. How many, how many days? We, we write a, when we write a ticket, well, I'm sorry, when we write a correction order, we give them 14 to 30 days to comply. If they don't contact us, we issue a ticket. Normally that court date is anywhere from 15 to 35 days. And then we go to court. If they don't show up or if they're found responsible, then we immediately do second round tickets. So another property. Actually, they're working on that to put, you know how your water goes to your taxes? Mm -hmm. They're working on doing that with the DAH um, tickets, where they can put the tickets on the property because that's what they we're not, you know, we understand the game. And what they do is, they get so many tickets, then they show up with a deed that's been backdated. And unless we can start putting these penalties to the property, where it doesn't matter who has it, it goes to the property, then we'll get some results. But that's above my pay grade. Legal's working on it. And that's, a, that's what people which suits that polo. <laughs> guys got my number. I'm, I'm very accessible. Like I said, you guys pay my salary. You pay my phone bill. I'm here for you. And it's my pleasure.
we've got 23,000 sitting in the CD. So financially, we're in good shape. Dues are coming in. Um, I sent out reminder postcards the other day, and they hit Thursday, and they picked up like 25 people have paid their dues since then. So we're up to 551. We're sneaking up on that 600.
advantage of that. We had a lot of participation in that program. It was really popular. And I hope you noticed this summer when you drove around that maybe there were some new rose bushes, some new flowers, some new planting. Um, so if you if you know who on your block maintains your island, you know, give them give them a shout out. Tell them thank you. Um, it's a lot of hard work, but it keeps our our neighborhood looking good, improves our home values. So to that end, I would like to bring up the members of the Garden Committee that are here with us tonight to uh, give out the awards uh, for this year's Island Beautification Program. Ruth Remus, I see Carolyn Murphy, and I see Deborah Stoller. So we are kind of like those behind the scenes sleuths that are driving around looking at your islands and taking pictures and seeing who's doing what. And, um, we've been doing this for a few years now. Deborah is a, a wonderful master gardener and she maintains several firms of businesses on Grand River. If there's one that looks kind of nice, it might be Deborah that does that. And uh, Carolyn's part of the community garden. And so these are very good gardeners that I'm standing next to that uh, kind of you know, inspire me. Um, uh, I think that we take very much pride in what we do, and we think that our neighbors take very much pride in what they do. Um, if you drive by the islands and they look lovely, it just encourages all of us to be glad we live where we live, and it's like, wow, that island looks so nice, and you can see that there's really a lot of effort that was put into it, and uh, we take uh, gratitude from all of you that do that. It's a lot of hard work. It's pulling weeds and planting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, anyway, um, uh, the, uh, what we decided to do this year, instead of just acknowledging the block captains, which we've done in the past, this year we're really trying to focus upon what we call the island beautifiers. These are the people that actually work in the islands. And it could be the block captain, but it could also not be. It's one of those silent grunts in the trenches that is out there pulling weeds and planting and, you know, sometimes even spending their own money buying mums to brighten it up for the fall or something, which we've noticed, and uh, again, it's very encouraging. Um, so, uh, with that being said, and not to prolong this, uh, what we have are some winners, and we'll tell you what the, um, the category is and who the winners are, and uh, Carolyn, God bless her, has all these certificates, and we'll pass them out. So, uh, would you like to start, Deborah, and tell us who our first place winner's circle is? Okay, first place winner's circle is Rosemont, Shalvat, and Finkel. The Island Beautifiers are Carrie and Phyllis Lovett, Martha Leaf, Cheryl Ball, Chris Gravel, and the block captain is Chef Chef and Mary Powell. revamping 
that whole island and it's just impressive. So the island beautifiers are Carrie and Phyllis Levette, Martha Cleves, Cheryl Ball, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the next one, Cortrell Barnes, uh, Emily Wallwinkle, Catherine Gamma, and Cynthia Lewis, Cortell Brown, Barnes, and Ivan Johnson are the block captains. If any and all of you people are here, please come up. Circle winner from last year 
which is Warwick Del Ponte Finkel. And um, that's Jill Loeffler and Dennis Jones and also Vicki McClellan. So if you come on to Warwick from Finkel, you'll notice that even during the holidays right now, there are scarecrows and things that, that uh, Jill has put into those trees to make sure that it looks seasonal. And uh, they have really embraced the idea of being a winter circle uh, by getting it last year and just continuing to enhance its beauty. So Jill is here. I don't know if anybody else is here, but please come up. Get to 
safety mm. and really just perform a really heroic role in the moment. We so many times hear about and now we see about the cell phone, people just kind of like standing by while tragedy is happening and just reporting it and you're wondering why didn't you help? Um, these are neighbors who stepped up and helped. And I really like to think that embodies the spirit of Rosedale Park. We really are a place where you know your neighbors and even if you don't know them, you try to help them if you can. Anyway, um, we wanted to honor these neighbors tonight, and I know there have already been honors. Um, you can find this story in the news. You can Google it just like I did, and there are news reports on them. They've been honored by, um, they've, they've received, I think, honors from, from the governor um, and maybe some other local bodies. But we wanted to honor them right here in Rosedale, um, where their home is, and just let them know how much we appreciate um, what they did that day um, on Warwick. So I want to invite Chris Beebe up. Um, let's give him a hand. Um, so the neighborhood called the fire department. 
Um, they probably showed up like right after we got them out of the backyard. Um, so it was probably a matter of like five minutes uh, before they showed up. So they were very quick um, and they were able to get that fire down um, pretty, and, and tame, uh pretty quickly as well. So um, they did a lot of good, they even, uh, the dog was caught in the fire. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to get the dog out, but I did know that they did say they tried to even resuscitate the dog. Um, so they really did try everything they could. Um, so they did a good job. traffic engineer about that. 
Um, we asked for one of those big signs that you see that says, this is the speed limit and this is the speed you're going. Those big digital signs that tell you as you go, they track your speed and kind of like shock you into slowing down. Uh, we asked for one of those to, to be placed on Grand River. Um, and what we were told was that they can do that, but apparently there are only a few of them in, in each county at any given time. And they don't like to leave them indefinitely because people just become a newer to them where they just stop seeing them after a while. But it seems like it's something that can be effective if it's used on a short-term basis or it's used intermittently where you're just told, you know, the speed limit is 35 and you're going 45, slow down. So we asked for that. Um, we asked for the weeds, <laughs> the plantings that are on the medians, which was supposed to be low maintenance tall grass that just ended up being weeds. We asked for that to be ripped out. We want new plant material put in. Um, either, probably, probably won't be flowers because that's too, main, too high maintenance, but some other type of um, low maintenance plant material that actually looks good, that looks aesthetically pleasing. Um, can anybody think of any other specific items that I haven't named? Ivan, am I missing something? No, I have one, one quick question. Was there any well, I won't get to questions, but let me just finish. Because I, I do want to answer questions. Were there any other? Repair all the curbs. And right. Them with paint yes. And reinstall the crosswalk holes for Yes. For Thank you. So repairing the curbs that have been damaged due to accidents and also um, re fixing those uh, holes that have been damaged and things like that at the crosswalks. So, we have a very specific list of items, of acts that we've made. We have a follow-up meeting December 3rd to see what progress um, we have by then, and then we'll follow up in and update you. Um, but we do want you to know that we're working on this, and hopefully you will see some changes on Grand River. So we have a question right here. Yes, well, was there any discussion of, of maybe actually lowering the speed limit on Grand River for that section? Yeah, I mean, that was the whole point of, of, of it, was to bring the speeds down. And one of the things we learned was that generally when they do a project like this, they come out after the project is completed, and they do an assessment, right? And they say, okay, these were the speeds before the project, these are the speeds after the project. So you can know, is this project working? That didn't happen here, in part, they said, because of COVID. Um, for one thing, if you think about it, when the project was completed in the spring of 2021, you really weren't getting the true speeds on Grand River or the true, you know, the, the traffic because everything had to open back up, open back up. And so they wanted to wait until they had a real sample of cars to know what the speeds were. But it doesn't sound, to what, what they know about the speeds, it doesn't sound like the speeds have slowed down. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know what we need to do to get that reduced to maybe 25. I mean, I, just, I don't think that's, it may not be realistic because that's such a big highway. Um, but the thought, the hope was that the design itself would influence drivers to go slower. And that's really what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to signal in your mind, okay, the lanes are narrower, so I need to slow down. And for some reason, there's a disconnect there. That's not happening. And I'm not a traffic engineer, so I don't know how all of that works, but I do think we can do some things to make it safer. And some things that aren't that expensive, like going at in and ripping out all of the concrete islands, some things that are simpler than that, like fixing the traffic signals and um, making the bollards reflective. Thank you, Madam uh, I'm Aaron Hall. Had this result happen. You know, one of the concerns that wasn't brought up was the business community 
uh, the action is taking place there. I believe somebody got like a bumper stuck, you know, uh, in their building. Or, you know, who's picking up the free after these accidents? Because there are so many of them taking place. You know, she, she heard that one, but there are a lot of old accidents. So, Madam President, if possible, if anyone listening to this, uh, I know you're streaming probably through something. <laughs> but uh, if anyone hears this or anyone knows, can you please send them to Madam President and they can forward to us because we're in the process of collecting that data. Hey, Aaron, you got a general email that we can send all this information to? Uh, yes, Council Member Tate at Detroit in my Thank you for that. Hi, I, I can include him and Council Member Tate in my recap of the meeting. That way they'll have a complete list. Right. And in that email, you will also see all the people that came to that meeting. There were 16 people. Mm -hmm. And in addition, uh, I'm inviting Councilman Tate and yourself to come on December 3rd because we're going to have another meeting. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have Michigan Department of Transportation, Detroit Department of Public Works, Concerned Citizens, uh, 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 Stephanie Young as well, our, our state rep. So you're going to have some people there. So if you guys come, it will be very beneficial. So if you uh, are finish here, give me your email information and council can take it, and I'll make sure that you get the information. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Nancy? I just want to make a comment. Yeah. Listening about this, people even know this somebody stop at a red light like it's a stoplight and then go right on through it because they you know, and it's, or either they're just ducking and dodging. To me, it's a behavior that has been a result of the pandemic to me. But I, I, I'm just saying that to say it's not just Grand River. I see that wherever I go in the city, it's, I, I see the same, the same behavior. Same behavior. Yeah, when we were in the meeting with the city and state officials, one of the things they said was that, exactly to your point, they noticed, a, for some reason, a rise in speed rates across the country yeah. since the pandemic. I don't know what that's about. I don't even see the connection there, but I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a causation there or if it's just coincidence, but that is something that they mentioned, and I agree with you about enforcement, Nancy. Um, we can have all of the design we want, all of the, you know, all of the nice features we want, but if nobody's there giving tickets when people are speeding, it's That's not going to be effective. That's it. That's it. The other thing I want to add to that is, whenever I call some office for a municipal meeting, I'm always asked if they can't Each other, and they hate having to work with each other. 
I wanted to remind you the project was a combined project. I think the MDOT was going to repay Grand River anyway, have nothing to do with bike lanes or pedestrian crosswalks or all this stuff. And the city had this money and they said, oh, we'll work with you. And at the same time, we can do this streetscape stuff. So I think it was like $7 million from the state did the repaving and maybe like one million in the city that did the bike lanes and so forth and so on. So it's almost all the things that are driving us nuts and that we're not happy about are the city's problems, not anything really that the state of Michigan did. But I do want everybody to realize the only reason that we're getting the attention that we're getting from the DPW officials and the MDOT officials, the only reason because how many of you have tried to reach out and crickets? All of a sudden, our state rep put her hands together and called these people up and they said, oh yes ma'am, we'll be glad to come to a meeting. So I just want you to understand why we're finally starting to make a little bit of progress. And I just want to appreciate her because she's doing a great job. Thank you. Take their trash in and out and you know take their kids to school. They're 
favorite part of our neighborhood. What would that look like if now that house is a, is a property where people come and go every three days, there's somebody new there. Every week, there's somebody new there because it's just a short-term rental property. How would that change the character of your block, um, the character of Rosedale Park? That's what I want to put on your mind. Um, and if you are worried about that, um, have you take action about it, okay? Um, there are a couple of things you can do. HB 472, I believe is still up for consideration. I don't think it's been voted on yet. Um, it's my understanding that it was before um, the state the, the, uh, regulation reform committee. Um, because this is already passed out of the House and is now in the Senate, you would need to contact our state senator, who is Betty Jean Alexander. Um, you can also contact any member of the Senate Regulatory Reform Committee um, and voice your opinions if you are concerned about this. Um, with regard to the zoning proposal, um, the timeline for that is that there is now a draft proposal that's being circulated internally within city departments. And um, by March of 2022, uh, they expect to have a final proposal um, with public hearings. So if you are concerned, we need to be going to those hearings and we need to be voicing our concerns and talking about the things that we are concerned about. Um, there's supposed to be a the debate on this is supposed to start with city council uh, in June of 2022. So there's not a lot of time. This is already kind of fleshed out and in writing. So I would look at, go to the website, go to zonedetroit.com and, and check it out. Um, read up on it. See if this is something that you want in, your, in, in our community. And if not, um, contact your representatives. Contact council member Tate. You know, contact your city councilman. And voice your concerns about this because this is something that really does, I think, have the potential to um, drastically change our neighborhood and not in a good way. And the other important thing to know is that these bills are primarily backed by um, developers and investors, not by everyday people like you and I. And you need to think about why that is. And I don't know about you, but I get a call about once a week from an investor who just wants to buy my property and flip it. They're not looking to rent it to another family like ours. It's going to stay here long term, be, in, be a part of this organization, work on the island committee, get involved. They want to flip it, right? And what does that look like if that is multiplied over and over and over again? Don't be fooled. The properties in our neighborhood are attractive. Because even though our property rates are going, our property, yeah, our property rates are going up, there's still our the house prices are much lower than some of the other neighborhoods in the city. It is a very attractive place to live. It's stable, it's family friendly, it's quiet. And it's that way for a reason. Zoning is a big part of it. And that's not to say that there can never be any short-term rentals in our neighborhood, there can never be any Airbnb, but we really have to be careful about having a one-size-fits-all approach that allows for no regulation because that's when you may see a tipping point and you may see a critical mass of these properties in our neighborhood. Okay, questions? Yeah. yeah, two things I thought about was parking. If we get many, many newer places, where are they going to park? They're going to park in the street. They're not going to park in the driveway. It's bad enough as it is. Um, number two is, if you're a developer, you got money. You can go to Councilman Tate. You can go wherever you want because you got money. You can pay for the stuff. We don't have that kind of money. We don't, it's just us. So it's something to think about. And I know that Councilman Tate, when when people, a group of people talk to him, he listens. He always listens. But if we as a as a, as a community, and at the Grand Mount Rosedale, all of our community, if we get together on this. And, and, and talk to our council people and our representatives, things will things may change. This they may say, well, I don't know. I don't know what the whole law says at this point, but it's really something to think about. about this in our neighborhood at all. 
but if, if we are to have it, I'd be a lot less worried if property is owner occupied. In other words, I could run out a bedroom or two people. I'm the owner of the home and I'm there. I'm on site. So if weird stuff is going on, my neighbors can talk to me. I'm there. I live in the house and I own it. As opposed to the XYZ LLC uh, in New Zealand owning the Airbnb, and if bad behavior is going on, exactly who are you planning to call to complain about that? So if the bill is going to pass, it would be really helpful if we could insert language to require that it be owner-occupied properties. Because and this is the second point about it that I'm really not happy about. I don't like Lansing taking away our say. Because this is a one-size-fits-all. This is a statewide law which says local municipalities cannot limit, cannot regulate, cannot do anything. Don't have the right to in any way make laws or regulations affecting Airbnbs. So, for heaven's sakes, Traverse City is not Detroit, is not Port Huron, is not Grand, I mean, all of these different communities that you can think of around the state that have very different populations and very different needs and so on. It's, I can see it working great in certain communities. But for Lansing to take the authority away from local cities and towns and just issue this law that goes across the board, of course, that's very convenient, see, for developers and investors. They don't want to have to deal with all these different sets of regulations in all these different cities, right? This would be way more convenient for them than it would just be open season. All right, so that's the two things I want you to know about this Airbnb stuff, is that it's, first of all, Lansing, once again, taking away local control, even though these Republicans always say they're in favor of local <laughs> control, right? And the fact that it, in its current incarnation, doesn't require owner occupancy that allows all site owners. The stuff about the changing the R1 zoning to allow two dwellings, that is a really important issue that we really must let council member Tate know how you feel about that. Because I think that, like the Airbnb, has the potential to completely upend our neighborhood completely change the character of it. If you are an investor and own a property that you're renting out, why collect one rent when you can collect two? You know? And people who are calling people up and wanting to buy their homes, they'll figure out ways to subdivide the houses. So houses that have been single family will become duplexes, and the noise, the traffic, the parking, the dogs, there'll be more dogs. I mean, everything <laughs> that we complain about in our neighborhood will be greatly increased. So I think it's a terrible idea because the proposal is that it would be by right. You could build this mother-in-law suite in your backyard or whatever, or to subdivide your house, and it would be your right to do that by right. You would not have to have a special land use hearing, yeah, I see an um, incredulous look on Daniel's face. Yes, that's the other part about it, is that it's a high rate proposal. So uh, this is what out-of-town consultants will get you. Um, it's a proposal of changing zoning, apartment zoning, to allow two dwellings per parcel. is a very popular proposal in places like San Francisco, New York, Seattle, where there's no land, where there's a crisis, there's not enough housing, they need more housing, and there's no land to build any more housing on, and so the idea is to subdivide some of the housing you already have. I can understand that as a solution in those environments. Those are not problems we have here in Detroit. We've got plenty of land. If you want to build some houses, wow, we can fix you up. If you, if you want to fix up houses, we got plenty of houses that need fixing up. 
That would be another way to increase housing. It's a solution that doesn't match any problem that we face in Detroit. So I'm really against it, as you figured out already. So let council member take because the planning commission works for the council. They don't work for the mayor, they work for the council. So this is a council initiative to have hired these zoning consultants who are redrafting all the zoning of Detroit. And this was the proposal that just jumped out at me as something that would really have an adverse effect on our neighborhood. So, yes. Well, the question I have is what about the historic community? That's it doesn't matter. Yeah. It does not matter. Historic districts are not protected. The person would still have to go through the historic district process, which means you have to write it all up, what you're planning to do, and submit your proposal to the historic district commission. They would have to approve your proposal, and they'll be every bit as picky about building additions and subdivisions as they are about projects that you and I want to do in our own homes. So it's not like they could just leap over that. But it would, it's a, again, it's a one size fits all. Every R1 parcel in the city of Detroit would be rezoned to allow two dwelling units per parcel. Well, that was my question when you were describing this. Is it sounds like they're basically turning an R1 into an R2, and I don't understand why would you change one? I mean, it's a shortcut, right? Because if you change R1, then you don't have to go through the process of changing a zone to a different because that's a so R2. I think now allows two. Our, the proposal is R2 would allow four, and R3 would allow sixteen. Yeah, they're dramatic <coughs> changes. To allow dramatic increases in density. But it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, if you wanted to do that, then change an R1 area to an R2 area, and then increase, if you want to have more, then change those, change a zone to a different designation. Don't change the designations. It, it doesn't make any sense to me no, why you would go about it that way. That's why you and I are not consultants. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Hey, can I, can I add, add, add something? Also, with the Historic District Commission, if, do, if the modifications are not visible from the, the street, they're not going to have a lot to say. I'm a former commissioner, so there's not much that they can do, especially if you're doing an addition on the back of your house that's not visible from the front. Yeah, 
Well, yes and no, Yeah, I mean, to some extent. I, I, I understand. There, there's some, it's going to have to match. Yeah, it's going to have to match, but, but if it's not visible from the, from the street, it's not going to be a lot that they're going to be able to do to say, you can't do it unless there's some other. Yeah, but if you're building an apartment well, actually, back there, how is I mean, it not going to be visible? <laughs> it's not a doghouse. The real problem is, <laughs> Yeah. And don't ask the historic district or the building department. They just proceed. So yeah. it's easier to ask for forgiveness later. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. So it will be a green light for all that behavior. People will just turn their head mark. Is it a fair assumption that Rochelle Association has communicated officially to both city council and also to the state? And has GRD received on this? Well, I know Rolandale is probably going to be putting together a written communication about this. And I mean, this is, yeah, we've had some communication, but we're going to be doing some written, some formal written communication on this issue. I would just encourage you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. But then my question is, don't you have to have buy-in for, for, for everybody to do that, to speak on behalf of the neighborhood? What? So um. the, the Airbnb legislation is different from this zoning thing. The Airbnb legislation is all written out and it exists and it passed the House and now it's in the Senate. So we could, we could definitely take positions on that because it's all concrete. The zoning thing, this revision of the zoning, it's in this gray area right now. It's not quite an official proposal yet. They are going to have a series of public hearings. That's why I'm sounding the alarm now. Has Council Member Tate heard about this and does he have a position on it? So I want to speak to, and I want to be very uh, careful with how I word my statements with this one. In regards to how it's due on 4722, last I checked on Friday, Council will be submitting a resolution uh, speaking against the uh, removal of local control uh, short term housing leasing. So, so yes. that's happening. I can speak that 100%. With regards to the second item we discussed, with regards to change in zoning, I will have to look into that one. I don't want to get into this information. That's the most thing too. But I can look into that deep. Thank you for that. That is that's good to know. Um, two additional points I want to make. Go ahead, Nancy. I was thinking, why community like us are going to do this? Is there some way to mobilize the rest of the community to make this a city? I mean, why would anybody want this? Yeah, I mean, other communities are already concerned about it. There was an article in Indian Villages uh, neighborhood newsletter this week that went really in depth into the into that issue. And um, I know North Rosedale has, has its eye on it. I mean, I think you're going to see other neighborhoods other than, than Rosedale being, um, being concerned about it and, and taking a, a position on it. Uh, I did want to make two additional points. The first is that, I mean, I just want to be clear what Pam was saying about this being by right. So if, if you wanted to build another structure on your property, like an apartment garage or something like that, you could go to the city and try to get a variance. There's a process for that where you can say, hey, I have this other use I want to use, and here's why it would negatively affect, affect my block, and here are the reasons why I need this. And the city can consider that, and if, 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 if it seems proper, grant you a variance to let you do that. So it's not like this would totally um, take away people's right to do it. What it would do is just say, you don't even need to go through that process. You could just do it because you feel like it, because you want to do it, totally unrestricted. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing that I didn't mention is, um, in addition to uh, the two parcel per lot change, there also is a proposed change um, to allow home-based businesses in R1 districts. So <laughs> think about you know, your neighbor opening a barber shop in, in their basement, or a tattoo parlor, or <laughs> you know, any type of home-based business that you could that you could think of, where you would have additional people coming to visit the house, additional traffic, additional parking issues, 
That right now is not allowed in R1, this would allow that. And so that's another thing you might want to keep your eye out on. How is that going to affect your neighborhood if we allow that? Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this is an issue that we need to mobilize on if we are concerned about it. So uh, be watching your emails and see you're sure you're going to be seeing some communications from us about it. Um, and attend the public hearings, talk to your council your city council member, talk to your state senator, call and email, let them know how you feel about it. Okay, um, before I get to the last issue, which is the winter events, I just wanted to bring up, we have um, uh, from GRDC here, um, Kyle Marcellus. Kyle, you want to come up? Kyle is our new um, community engagement person at GRDC, so I just wanted to invite him up to uh, tell us a little bit about himself, about what he does at GRDC, and just uh, meet everybody here at Roseville. Okay, basically, um, I'm the new community engagement manager, and uh, you know, it's an honor to, to be here. Um, I'm real passionate about you know, community development, and basically, um, my role. Um, well, what I'm working on currently, I'm just basically just trying to, I'm working with the, <laughs> I'm a little nervous too. But I'm, <laughs> so I'm working with um, basically uh, the vacant, um, task, task. vacant property task force, yes, and the property virtual task force. And we're basically, you know, we're just, um, you know, just, just basically, you know, coming up with goals. And, and again, we're just, uh, I'm just trying to get just acclimated in the world. And uh, again, it's, uh, um, I have a master's in community development and my uh, my bachelor's is in social work. So again, I um, you know, and um, I'm born and raised in Detroit. I'm also a homeowner, and um, I, I don't necessarily live in this neighborhood. I live in Bagley, so but it's an honor to get back to my community and take on the community engagement role. And you all will see me around the community, you know, just trying to you know again get activated and, and get you all involved as well. So thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's Aaron. I'm uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I also I had the opportunity to work with um, Mr. Mr. James Tate. I worked with uh, Mr. James Tate, his uh, D1 initiative, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. And um, uh, what is what did he say? I can tell this story better than he can. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very proud of, of him and how far he's come. I can remember uh, being in the community. Walked up to me, and I'm not accustomed to people being bigger than that. He walked up to me, and I looked up, looked up, and I said, Can I help you? He said, Hey, y'all hired? And I said, Uh, hey, I'm trying to ask him. He did actually good. Yes. Yes. But yes, he has, um, yes, but yeah, I'm, you know, just again, yeah, like, I'm very passionate about, you know, community development, and, and, and again, I want to give back to my community. And, and I, it, was a, it was an honor to work with Aaron and Lee and um, James Tate. And, you know, I'm passionate about economic development, too, so it all ties in. Yes? Community uh, development in what aspect? Um, again, like, economic development, I would say, like, uh, I'm, I'm real passionate about, about housing. And, and again, with the, um, with, with Mr. Beasley was mentioning, like, you know, just, just blight and eradicating blight. And, and, and I would just like to ultimately, ultimately, I would like to see, you know, more retail, you know, commercial development in the city. So I'm, I'm more, you know, more, more inclined to like, you know, economic development, you know. Well, well, well. Okay, well, welcome, Kyle. Um, Thank you. It's good, it's good to have you here. So we are at the end of our agenda, hanging there. We only got a couple more things. So just want to update you on winter events. Um, we will not be having a pancake breakfast this year. We talked about it as a board, and we thought um, with vaccinations not yet uh, being widely available, they actually just became available for ages 5 to 11. But, you know, because so, uh, so many of the people that come to enjoy the pancake breakfast are kids that can't yet be vaccinated, um, we thought it would be a good idea to hold off on that this winter. And seeing the numbers where they are now, they're still at about 72,000 cases you know, nationwide um, every day. And 
that number has stabilized, it's plateaued. Actually, it was ticking up a little bit today when I checked the New York Times. It was up 5% um, from 14 days ago. But we really don't know what the winter is going to bring. And indoor gatherings are just difficult, especially when they involve food and kids and people being in really close quarters. So we won't be doing that this year. Really hoping and praying that we can do it again next year. We do currently plan to have the gala in January. We plan to bring that back. Um, talking about some ways we can do that safely in terms of, you know, masking or uh, vaccination requirements. We haven't put anything in and set anything in stone yet, but we're talking about that. But um, that is a really popular event that people have missed, and I can sense the, you know, the lack of cohesion with not having events in our neighborhood. It really does affect the synergy of your neighborhood when you can't see neighbors and see them out. I mean, it's nice to see each other at these meetings when we come and do business, but we need to be able to see each other just as friends too and come out and hang out. So um, we really do want to bring the gala back. The plan is to bring that back in January, but it may, it may not look like it looked in 2019. It may be a little bit scaled down, but we do want to do it in some form. So just watch the newsletters and watch your emails about information about that. Um, I don't have anything else unless people have questions, general questions, or things they want to raise. Hey, I just got a general comment. Um, I'll be on Jackson Block Captain. Last bit, put the shelf on me. Now, we had an issue with uh, waste management picking up our trash. Yeah. And I actually contacted and talked to a supervisor. That I can't go any further than that for now. But what was explained to me that they started, they made their transition as of November the 1st. And through that transition, they either didn't transition some of the employees over from the advanced disposal yet, including the rock manager that's doing our current rock. So it actually took them till today to pick up our trash on the east side of the street, which is hilarious, because they picked up the west. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's weird. And this is the second week in a row that there was an issue with that. And I said, okay, now I, I really got to call and make some, make some time to do something now. <laughs> so I have a direct conversation. Um, uh, Tim Hess is the gentleman that's supposed to be the uh, district manager. I'm trying to tap him for the information. I was going to email the city and see if I can get the information on that. But uh, Pam, I'm going to ask you, how long does the contract if you, if, if you know it's time for any of the uh, stuff? It was just yeah. renewed. It was just renewed. How long is it, though? I'm not sure it's still the limit. What I can do is uh, today was a day filled with about five meetings. I'll give you the individual level we can speak with right when you go overseas on So there's a guy step up for who you are interested in. And I'll give you his interview. Good. Like I said, I understand the transition is going to take a little time, but it's still not acceptable. We, exactly. We didn't have a drop off with advanced disposal. It was like, oh, night and day, like, keep going. I understand. But you know, that, that's my only issue. If, if you, like I said, and, and it was impressed upon me that we had to call individually, and I said, no, nah, I'm not doing it. So I said, this is for my street. I'm sending the guy to pick up the stuff, or there's going to be more issues for me. Mm -hmm. And the guy actually showed up with the wrong truck, but they showed up, please. <laughs> so I guess they understood that. But be vigilant on something that is your tax dollars. So I want you to understand that this is your money that they're, that they're appropriating and spending. So please make sure you present on any issue that you have. That will be. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Leah. Thanks for raising that. Okay. Any other questions or concerns before we close? Okay. Oh, the election. All right. Um, do we have ballot results? Yes, we do. <laughs> Go on up there, Earl. I know everybody is just on the seat of their chair.
I have some amazing news. <laughs> <laughs> that everyone on the ballot here has been unanimously voted in. <laughs>
or to make it easy, just go on TroyMI.gov, search District 1, click Councilman Tate's page, and you can see all of our social medias, our Facebook, our Gov Delivery, where we'll text all this stuff to you. But please, we want you to be there also for quality of life issues that we covered a lot about with regards to things like speeding, with things like littering and parking in the wrong places. Coffee with a cop is tomorrow. Coffee with a cop takes place at 10 a.m. over at the 8th Precinct. Uh, right by Myers if you've never been there, but it's an opportunity for you to sit down with leadership, with the MPOs and say, hey, I live on Gladstone here. Hey, they are driving really fast. They are speeding. Hey, they are really loud. These are issues that we want to make sure you're equipped to handle uh, in the community, not on your own, but in a more streamlined approach. So I've heard those things say, I've called my MPO, they have an answer. I've done this, and they have an answer. When I call the 8th Precinct, well, hey, come look them in the face and tell them. Uh, I'll be there, and I hope to see you there as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please give us a call, 313-224-1027. Again, that number is 313-224-1027. It is so good to be in front of people now. I feel like I want to start everything with greetings. I hope this message finds you well. There are real life people here now. <laughs> please give us a call. Uh, we will say that we are operating uh, with a shorter team, I'd say a skeleton crew. Uh, so please be patient, you know, we've got literally about four people on our team now. I've got about 40 calls I'm making, I have no exaggeration when I say that. So please give us a call, please let us allow us to help you out. I look forward to speaking with you. My name is Aaron Hall. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Can I drop this microphone? That's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. Good night.